everybody, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live on this Tuesday afternoon. I'm so excited to have uh, my friend, new friend, Whitney here today. Um, one of the topics that you may not hear a lot about, but is so crucial to overall health is our oral microbiome, our, our dental health. And we're going to dive deep because Whitney is a dental hygienist and has made it kind of her calling and her work um, to talk about this and the systemic effects that our dental health and our oral microbiome can have on things that you would never suspect, like risk of dementia, who knew, right? Or risk of systemic cardiovascular disease. So i um, super excited to get into this talk today and really bring awareness around this topic. Whitney is a registered dental hygienist who's also known as Teeth Talk Girl on social media. Her journey of spreading dental health awareness began on YouTube platform where she continues to create educational videos for the public. She's extremely passionate about sharing information regarding the importance of dental health. And I couldn't agree more. So welcome, Whitney. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to talk about all this. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, and again, I, I feel like this is so critical in functional medicine. We look at the whole body, of course, and I am not a dental expert. I can't pretend to know everything about it, but I know enough to know a lot of my patients' complex chronic disease comes from the oral microbiome, from cavitations, from um, old root canals or things that are creating more burden on the system. So we'll dive into that. But I always love a story as far as how did you get where you are as far as dental hygienist? Did you always know you wanted to do this? Tell me kind of your journey to get into this field. Yeah, of course. So I actually always thought I was going to be a dentist. When I was a kid, I just loved going to the dentist. I was one of those kids that was like, I couldn't wait to get my sticker at the end of the appointment. Yeah. I just liked my dentist. She was very young and new at the time when I was a kid. And I just, she was spunky and fun. And I think I just liked her. And I thought, I want to be her when I grow up. And I didn't realize she was like a dentist. I don't know. But in my mind, that was always in my mind. But then when I got to college, you know, I still was like, you know what, I'm doing this. I'm pretty good at science. I, let's do this. And so, and then in college, we had to do shadowing and observation hours in pre-dental club. Mm -hmm. And that's where I quickly found out that I do love dentistry, but I don't love the re restorative aspect as much as the preventative aspect. I always found myself, I was watching, I thought it's awesome what you can do to fix teeth. I of course watched all the exciting procedures, root canals, crowns, fillings. I loved watching, but then I was always like, what's going on in that other room? What are they doing? I was always like turning my head to watch the hygienist because I was so interested in preventing all this from happening. You know, I, I don't know. I just, so then I kind of did a little shift. I was like, maybe I don't want to go to dental school. So I never applied. I thought, you know what, let's try dental hygiene first. And then maybe I'll go to dentistry later. Like just, I want to make sure that this is what I want. I don't know what I want. So I went to dental hygiene school and I never looked back. I fell in love. I was like, this is for me. This yeah. is exactly what I love. I want to prevent. I love, I was also a dental assistant. So after all that, so I, you know, I love watching the procedures. It's very cool to see a tooth get pulled out. I mean, <laughs> I think it's cool, but I was like, wait a second. No, I want to prevent this from ever happening. So that's kind of where the whole journey began on becoming a dental hygienist. Oh, I love that because in some a similar way, I went to medical school. I, wanted, I always wanted to help people heal and prevent disease. And I remember like surgery rotation, amazing, right? I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to take out organs or cut that blood vessels okay. or sew up things. I want to be there like saying, why did this happen in the first place and how could we prevent it? Or so it's so parallel yes. in some ways. And that so makes, I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So very, very cool. And I love, and you know, the hygienists are really so crucial. At least when I go to my dentist, I spend a lot more time with my hygienist than I do the actual dentist. And I love my, yes. I have three of them. So <laughs> oh, awesome! yes, that's another thing. I always notice that too. Like you said, um, you know, I want to really build a relationship with my patients yeah. and really, I want to see it's so yeah. Right. So many healthcare fields, there's so many that don't get to see their patients every six months or every three, like we really have a good routine of seeing the same people, patients over and over. And I was like, I want to spend as much time with them and really get to know them and know their overall story versus just their teeth. Gosh, I love that. So on to the next topic, which is like many people are, my listeners are very aware that dental health is so important, but let's kind of go back to basics. Like why would what's in your mouth affect your heart or your brain or other mm -hmm. organs? Give us the basics mm -hmm. on why this matters so much. Totally. So it's the oral systemic link. I, I just always want to say that word. I'm always like oral systemic link, oral systemic link. I'm trying, and just to like get the, um, 
the information out there on what this is, but basically the mouth is the gateway to the entire body, as we know, right? When we eat, we talk, we drink everything we do from our mouth. And so, you know, if something is infected in the mouth, such as gum disease is an infection of your gums, it creates a constant source of inflammation we all know inflammation isn't good. It can strain the immune system. So poor dental health, specifically causing gum disease or whatever the infection is in your mouth has been linked to several health issues. Like you mentioned, because specifically heart disease was one of the first ones they found with research because with gum disease, there's bad bacteria, right? There's harmful bacteria in the mouth associated with gum disease. And when this bad or harmful bacteria enters the bloodstream through the gums. It can travel throughout the body and it can travel to other parts of your body and cause inflammation in the other parts and damage to the tissues and the organs. So gum disease can increase your risk of heart disease, diabetes, diabetes, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, a bunch of other conditions. There's so much exciting research happening now, really showing us these links. And I think it's something to be aware of that your teeth and your mouth and your gums, everything dental health related is not just about having fresh breath and a pretty smile. That's part of it. We love that, but it's also about improving your overall well-being. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I would say some of the most complex chronic patients that I treat, which is kind of my specialty, who yeah. had unexplained symptoms of, you know, headaches or chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or whatever. Often it comes down to, if we've done all the work of the body, I'll say, you need to go see a biological dentist and someone who can really look at the mouth. So where would you start with asking questions for patients who might think that their dental health could be connected? What kinds mm-hmm. of questions would you ask them or where would you go with that? So, so many, so many ways it it depends, but I would say my, my mind was like, Oh my goodness, where do I start? I think it depends on always getting a thorough assessment first from your dentist and or dental hygienist, right? There's so many things, of course, the appearance of your gums can give you some clues, some signs into maybe something's going on with the gums, but oftentimes gum disease is like a silent unknown thing, especially with smokers, you can have gum disease and not even know it. Most people know the symptoms of like bleeding gums, red, puffy, gingiva, right? But if you're smoking, sometimes that constricts like the blood vessels so much in your mouth that you, it, you could go unknown. We, we didn't even realize you had gum disease. So a thorough assessment of your gums is so important and giving a complete medical history, health history to your dental professionals is so important too. I have so many patients that'll say, uh, you know, I'll say any updates in your medicine, anything new. And they're like, nothing that has to do with my teeth. And I'm like, uh, I got to hear it all. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I mean, I get where you're coming from, but like, if you changed a different medicine or this, there's, I mean, there's so much that relates to what goes on in your mouth and what you're doing with your overall body. So I think I would just start with, let's get a comprehensive exam, really figure out your whole background history, what's going on, and then a thorough assessment, really checking your gums, making sure if there's a patient or someone out there that's wondering if like, oh, maybe my dental health has to do with some other systemic things. I would say, make sure you're getting a thorough exam with perio charting. That's a big one that I think sometimes goes overlooked and unfortunately, so make sure they're checking your gums when they call out all the numbers. That's so important. I feel like go over for the people who might be listening and maybe doesn't know what that yeah. is. is that, that yeah. Happens? When you hear them, exactly. So when you're hearing them call out all the numbers, I, I think that's so important to just ask, Hey, did you check my gums? And if mm-hmm. they say, yeah, they look fine. I would say, ask me, or I would say, tell me more about what you found in the gums. You don't have to know all the technical things because I don't want to like overwhelm anyone. But like, I think the biggest thing is when we're checking your gums to understand is that there's a natural space between your gums and your tooth. That natural space should be between, you don't have to remember the numbers, but it should be between one and three millimeters. So when we're going around calling a bunch of numbers, if you hear a bunch of ones, twos, and threes, some hygienists might say it out loud. Some don't, some say it in their head and then chart it, you know, so just ask if you didn't hear them saying it. And if you got a bunch of healthy numbers, you're great. If you have some fours, like a four, not the end of the world, inflammation might be present, but fours are pretty reversible. We'll handle it depending on your overall situation. But if you get a lot of fives and above, that natural space is now a pocket. And that pocket is spots that bacteria, pathogens, stuff can get stuck in there. 
We don't want that. When there's more surface area to clean, you might need a different type of cleaning. So I always just urge patients to make sure that you're not just going in and in and out of the dentist. Like you don't want to, hi, how you doing? Good. Bye. And it takes like five minutes for a cleaning. You want to make sure you're getting comprehensive exam. At least they let, at least you want them to acknowledge that they checked your gums because the source of infection is most likely your gums. No, I love that you say that because we deal with the gut, the lipopolysaccharide, which is coating of bacteria. It can happen in the mouth as well. And you get a direct link to the bloodstream, which is means that what we have is endotoxemia from the mouth, not just the gut. And so what these things can do is just leak those little bacteria into the blood. And that I think is one of the most potent inflammatory triggers to the immune system. So back to all the things that you said, risk, what kinds of concerns or, or, or conditions might you be, if you hear the patient say, I have diabetes or I have, what things would you be most concerned about with dental health and the connection? Mm -hmm. So a lot of all of this, I don't want to say all of, but most of the systemic, any diabetes, heart disease, they all kind of relate in the mouth. It's very hard to determine like, oh, this is going in your mouth this is going on in your mouth, you probably have diabetes or this is going yeah. on, you probably have heart disease. It's very hard to say which one it is, but we can say one of these things might be going on, but say it is diabetes. If I know a patient has diabetes, I'm always uh, like with everyone, I triple check. But with someone with diabetes, we also talk about home care a lot. Home care is so important. There's only so much we can do every six months or every three months, depending on what your dental regimen is of going into the dentist. But um, there's only so much we could do for you in the office. And a lot of it goes back to the patient talking about what they use at home. Do they use electric toothbrush? Do they use a regular toothbrush? Are they using it properly? Whatever they use. I like to dive into home care like I am a home care. I go into it like a wild person. I love home care because it's so, it shows when someone does the work at home and they come back in six months and I could say, wow, things look pretty stable. There's a few spots here or there that will, you know, reduce some plaque or tartar levels there. But if, if it's pretty good and stable, it's often due to home care. So the questions I would ask is what are you doing at home? Hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein Barr, and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. What are you doing at home? Uh, good. Okay. So say I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do at home. What would you advise the average patient? Um, I'm in my forties. So uh, what would you say is the ideal home regimen for someone like me? I always say that the, every dentistry is based on the individual, right? So like one thing that works for one person might not work another, but I do have a generalized answer. There's three things everyone needs to do. I always say it's like, there's only three things you need to do for your teeth. One is brush twice each day. Of course, two minutes each time whether you're using an electric toothbrush or a manual toothbrush, it doesn't matter. However, it's worth noting that an electric toothbrush has less chance of user error. Electric toothbrushes are easier to use. So you can use either of them. If, like the American Dental Association says they are equally effective in removing plaque. However, you gotta use them right. And that's why I like electric toothbrushes is because even for me, sometimes we're rushing. Yes. in the morning or at night. I'm like, I'd rather my electric toothbrush make sure it's doing a good job than me trying to. So I recommend that. But if you like your regular toothbrush, that's fine. Just make sure you're using it right. So brush twice each day, once in the morning, once at night. I always say in the morning, it should be before breakfast, before you eat or drink anything. A lot of people want to fight me on that. <laughs> But it's because, you know, they're nervous that the toothpaste, the mint is going to ruin the taste of their, you know, whatever they're going to eat for breakfast. But there's ways to rinse it away. It's so important. It's so critical to clean off a, that layer, that, that biofilm layer that accumulated overnight. Even if you're a perfect brusher when, before you go to sleep, it's inevitable. There's always bacteria in our mouth. There's still going to be stuff on your teeth when you wake up. So we want to remove that before you eat your breakfast. 
So that was all number one. That was a lot, but number one's important. We really, really need, there's so, I think there's a, there's polls out there that say it's about 40 or 50% of Americans say they only brush once a day. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I'm like, we got to change that. And we will just more and more people when we realize how important it is to brush twice. Now, the second thing is cleaning between your teeth. I try not to say flossing because there's other options. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I, I prefer, I love my water. You want, okay, good. Water <laughs> flossing is great. I think that's perfect. So that's a perfect example. I'm, I'm happy you do that. So that's what I always tell patients is like, if you don't like the traditional string floss, don't just say, I'm not doing anything. You still have to clean your teeth between your teeth with something. And whether that's a water flosser, a proxy brush, an interdental brush, those are the little ones that they look like little bottle brushes, yeah. almost like really micro um, floss picks. Uh -huh. something's better than nothing with the handles, sometimes dexterity issues, or you just have bigger fingers. It's hard to get in there with the floss. I rather you use something that you want to use. Cause if you want to use it, you're going yeah, you to use it. it. Exactly. exactly. So that's my second thing. Clean between your teeth, at least once a day, you only have to do it once before bed is the most optimal time. But, um, yeah. And then the third thing, this is a lot of people don't realize either is a tongue scraper, uh, yes. a tongue scraper. I, you know, I love a tongue scraper. Yeah, I do, There's, yeah. You do? Yes, you <laughs> dental hygiene, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, yes, I love a tongue scraper because 90, I think it's yes, 90 between 90 and 95 percent of bad breath bacteria is found on your tongue. So right there, like don't we all just want fresh breath? I try not to make it a cosmetic issue or but it is a big deal to have bad breath. You don't want that because when you think about it, that bad breath bacteria is also bad bacteria that you don't want accumulating going into your throat or your your gums that you just want to reduce the bad bacteria. You don't want to kill it off, but let maybe scrape some off. Yeah. So I love a tongue scraper. I do recommend, I have some patients that will say like, you know, I just, I brushed my tongue with a toothbrush. Is that, is that good enough? Not really. It's better than nothing, but really getting in there and scraping it. I always say you can use a spoon from your kitchen, a metal mm -hmm. spoon. It works actually really well. So those are my three things. Brush. And those are you better. I'm oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. No, you're fine. And, and tongue scrape. No, what's up? So brush between the teeth, yeah. tongue scraper. I love that. And I haven't heard many hygienists talk about the tongue scraping back in Ayurvedic medicine. It's so classically part of their. So I have some specific questions for you because um, I'm all about the quality of what we use too. So mm -hmm. um, toothpaste in particular, there are a lot mm -hmm. that have plastics, they have chemicals, they have polysorbates, they have mm -hmm. um, uh, polyethylene glycol, which is antifreeze. So I'm a big, big proponent of the mineral toothpaste, but I'd love to know your thoughts. So those would be ones mm -hmm. that have primarily ingredient of like hydroxyapatite or mm -hmm. have magnesium in the formula. They might have some xylitol, which is a known biofilm disruptor. That's a natural, mm -hmm. a sugar alcohol. Um, but I'm a big fan of those because in a moment, I want to talk about the harms of overkilling in the mouth because we need good bacteria, right? And Whitney, if, if you guys listening can hear me, I lost Whitney for a second here. I'm going to wait to see if she pops back on. So while we're waiting, I'll just talk about the mineral toothpaste. I um, like several brands. There are um, the hydroxyapatite based brands. Uh, one is rise. There we go, Whitney, you're back on. <laughs> I was just filling the space. I think you froze for a second. Um, okay. You froze too. I was like, she has the beautiful face that she froze on. <laughs> so who knows? What Sorry. Who knows what no, no worries. We're here. And so I'll just reiterate in case you guys missed us. We're talking about types of toothpaste. And uh, what's your thoughts on that? On kinds of. Okay. Yes. I heard the last thing I heard yes was like hydroxyapatite yeah. and using yeah. um, xylitol. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So yes, I'm, so I do follow the ADA guidelines, the American Dental Association guidelines and with fluoride in my toothpaste. Um, fluoride has been proven to be effective in preventing cavities, especially in low income areas that cannot afford the more expensive natural toothpaste. Um, nano hydroxyapatite, xylitol tend to be extremely more expensive than a normal fluoride toothpaste. So I use fluoride toothpaste. However, for anyone who doesn't want to use it, I am all about making sure it has nano hydroxyapatite in it. That is such a mouthful of a word. They need. <laughs> they sometimes call it like HAP or HAP, how they call it. But um, I am all about making sure it at least has that in there because the hydroxyapatite toothpaste do have research that are associated with them regarding remineralizing enamel. Whereas 
Xylitol does not. So although xylitol is very good at inhibiting plaque and it's disrupting the plaque, making your teeth clean, it's not as good at preventing cavities. I've had so many patients personally that have switched to a natural toothpaste, which is fine, all about it, but they come in and now they have, I, my best friend, she never had a cavity in her life. She switched, she came in and she had three cavities. So I was like, no. So it didn't have hydroxyapatite in it. It was only xylitol. So I just, if you are cavity prone and you do not want to use fluoride, I can't stress enough to make sure it has nano hydroxyapatite in it because that will actually strengthen and remineralize your enamel. At least the research that we have shows it. It's not approved yet by the American Dental Association due to a limited amount of research, but it's promising. It, it shows really good stuff. So once it's once it's approved, I'd be very excited to talk about it even more, but exactly. yeah, that's what I always tell my patients. Yeah. And I do want to give a caveat about fluoride because we see Alzheimer's yeah. patients that have fluoride deposits in yeah. their plaques. And so I yeah. have a concern about the swallowing and the absorption. I think sure. in those cases, like you say, there's clear evidence that it does bind um, the enamel. So in the really severe cases, all people like tap on there, rinse their mouth and make sure they're not swallowing any. So I agree with you in that sense. And, and yes. It's hard to publicly say this, but I also want my listeners to know I have grave concerns about fluoride. Now, if you have bad teeth, you're going to have to talk to your dentist and decide, but as a functional mm -hmm. doctor who sees a deposit yeah. for Alzheimer's, um, I would caveat that that's, uh, you have to really decide what's worth it. I'll tell you a perfect example. Yeah. It's a totally different thing. I had yeah. breast cancer at 25 years old. And so now I'm menopausal and I want to use hormones. Now there's now some yeah. safety data that says after breast cancer, we use hormones. But if I did have to decide between my brain and my breast, it's one of those decisions, hormones better for the brain, maybe not so much for the breast. And it's one of those things, kind of like fluoride. I think it's this, in some cases, fluoride can be harmful, especially if you're absorbing it or swallowing it systemically. But we know for the teeth, it's good. So I kind of want to say, I agree with you, but because we're public and I have listeners that um, have heard me say, be cautious about fluoride. I want to be real clear about that too. I love being able to have a, a, a what do you say, academic conversation. Yeah. Like, it's so cool to talk with you about this because a lot of times online, I don't love, I do social media about dental health. I don't love when people just throw claims out and like really? scream things right. about either way, fluoride's yes. good, fluoride's yeah. bad, fluoride's good. Fluoride. Everyone's just yelling at each other. So I love being able to have an honest conversation about it. And that is so important talking to your individual dental provider, healthcare provider yeah. regarding your needs. It's such an individual decision. It's your mouth. It's your body. I'm all about you do what you need to do or what you feel is best based on your, prof the professionals you've talked to opinions, statements, facts. I think that is a really, really good point. Um, there's always so many, so many facts about everything. Right. So I, I'm really happy to the enamel point, point is there's no, there's no question. It strengthens enamel. That's why I come to understand where you're coming mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then all the studies with the American Dental Association, they are showing that if you, if you're using it as intended, right. If you, but I am aware that some people maybe can't use toothpaste as, as intended. They accidentally swallow a lot of it, or they, you know, maybe, you know, different special needs populations or different populations that can not spit out properly. I think that's definitely a conversation to have as well with your dentist or your dental hygienist. There's so many, there's so many little nuances as to every decision you make. And I, yeah, that's what I advocate for on my dental health channel is on YouTube is always talk with your individual dental provider. It's great to hear the generalized information, kind of like the, what we just did, the make sure you brush, make sure you clip between your teeth, make sure your tongue scrape. There's, there's other things you might need to, to do it too, right? Like, that too. Um, and yeah. yes. And there's other things sometimes I recommend you do in addition, if you have something else going on, right? If you have sensitivity, if you have, if you have a bad breath, if you, if you're struggling with a certain specific situation, then you might have more things added to your routine or less. You never know. So I just always like to throw that out there. Yeah. Love it. Thank you so much yeah. for your expert. Oh, opinion. And then and yours as well. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention that I noticed you didn't mention, and I've just been diving into the research on nitric oxide. This isn't necessarily specific to uh, dental health, but it's a huge component of getting oxygen to the cells and vasodilating. And as we age, we produce less. And what we know is that fruit foods, fruits like, uh, 
sorry, vegetables and foods that contain high nitrates like beets and uh, root vegetables and celery and spinach and all these things. What happens is we actually eat these nitrate rich foods and the bacteria in our mouth converts it to nitrates, which then in our gut get converted to nitric oxide. So this really backstory is this nitric oxide really, really crucial. So what that means is if you use a really severely antiseptic mouthwash for long-term, you're destroying the bacteria that's creating nitric oxide, which is absolutely linked to long-term health. And what I noticed you didn't say mouthwash. Now you and I know there's certain conditions where there's an infection or there's a post Mm -hmm. And I would absolutely not, but I want to know your opinion. I want to put aside mine, but knowing that data on nitric oxide and that seven days of chlorhexidine, 80% decrease in nitric oxide production. So I was like, wow, I was using mouthwash. Guess what? Last week I stopped because of the data. So what's your opinion on, on mouthwash? Mm-hmm. When would you mm-hmm. use it? And had you heard those I, concerns about? Yes, I love it all. I'm so, I'm like, oh my goodness, I have like a hundred million, not a hundred million, but I feel like I have a hundred million. I don't know why I said that number. I have a bazillion videos on mouthwash because there's so many interesting facts about mouthwash. And you're like, what? Not only the, the nitric oxide stuff, it, some mouthwashes stain your teeth. Yes. So there, I could go on and on. Do Some are too, some are acidic. So yeah. they give you cavities, like what? Is somebody? Yeah. So I have a bunch of videos on that on my website, my website and my YouTube channel. But interesting, one more thing I want to say, I will dive into that about the nitric oxide is also relating it to dental health is breathing through your mouth versus breathing through your nose, right? And, and I, you probably know way more about this than me, but from my basic knowledge of it is mouth breathing it negatively impacts not only your dental health because you're more likely to have dry mouth, dry mouth causes cavities, but also your nitric oxide is reduced when you're breathing through your mouth. You're supposed to breathe through your nose. So that's a whole nother thing that's really cool in some specialty areas of dentistry that's really newer research for in the dental world at least, but it's very exciting. So anyway, back to the mouthwash. (laughs) So yes, if you breathe through your mouth, try not to, I always tell my patients, like it might just be a habit. However, if you cannot breathe through your nose, I was one of them. I had to have, so I had no, I had no airflow. I had no airway. My airway was messed up. So I had a deviated septum. I literally couldn't breathe through my nose. And I was always trying to, my nose yeah. was like, oh, I can't breathe. So, yeah, yeah. Um, terrible. No, I always say, don't force yourself. If you can't go see an ENT, go see someone to make sure you have right. the ability to breathe, breathe through your nose. Right. Okay. But mouthwash. Yes. So, okay. <laughs> Where do we start? I would say my biggest thing with mouthwash is never think you need to use it just because. A lot of people are like, what mouthwash should I use? I'm like, do you need to use one? Like, I think we all have this like thought in our right. mind that that's part of the dental health, yeah, regimen. And it's like, that's what we're supposed to do. But you might, you, most of the time, you don't need to. However, like you were saying, if you just had a procedure, there's some benefit risk ratios that maybe you yeah. should be kind of using it for a shortened amount of time as needed, right? It's usually like 10 to 14 days after a procedure, they'll give you those prescription strength mouthwashes. And yep. there's a reason for that, you know, to make sure things don't happen with your surgical spot in your mouth, all that stuff. It's kind of like but, having a wound on your body after surgery yes. with maybe neosporin or something. It's like, we don't use it's neosporin all over our body because our skin would be depleted of the microbiome. Them. But once go. in a while, I completely agree with you. There's appropriate use of yes, appropriate use. And yeah, and I go into all about it's very, it's unfortunate. It makes me sad that so many companies don't disclose that their mouthwashes are acidic. <laughs> like, because we all, I mean, in the dental world, acidity gives you cavities and enamel erosion, right? Acidity is in our, our sodas and our, our soda pop. I don't, I always call it the wrong thing, depending on which region I'm in. They're like, don't call it soda. Don't call it pop. <laughs> Soft drinks. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I'm calling it. But um, any type of, you know, what everything we eat is basically acidic and that's why it's bad for our teeth. So I'm like, why would mouthwash be acidic? So some of them are, acidic. I always say, try to find one that's a non-antiseptic and alcohol free is key as well. So all that stuff you're talking about is even enhanced when there's alcohol in it. Mm, We don't like alcohol mouthwash. That's the one. I don't know if that ever really needs to be Mm -hmm. in existence. A lot of people like to feel the burn. I guess I get that you like it, but you don't need to feel the burn. Try alcohol free alcohol just dries out the mouth. So, um, there was something else I want to say about that. It was so, oh yeah. So when you were saying over the appropriate level of swishing that goes to my, this is something that's been trending on TikTok and everyone's asking me about it. Swishing with peroxide straight from the bottle. Okay. 
have a lot of opinions on that. Speaking of mouthwash, some people use it as a mouthwash. And sometimes it's fine, but we've been seeing how the trends are happening on TikTok. They're doing it to whiten their teeth, which is fine because we do use peroxide in whitening products to whiten. However, like you just said, we put Neosporin on the wound. We, when we whiten our teeth, we put it on our teeth. We don't swish it around our entire mouth. So we have been seeing more and more people come into the office with something called black hairy tongue. That's what it's called. That's like the medical term. I know <laughs> exactly. Not, you I, know it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, when your microbiome, the bacteria in your mouth went wild because you are killing off all the good and bad bacteria every day, they're switching, they're switching for 30 minutes a day right now. That's okay. like the trend. I, I don't agree with this. If anyone's tuning in, <laughs> I do not think you should be switching with hydrogen peroxide for 30 minutes every day. You are, you are literally, and then we've also had patients come in where they burn their cheeks. Yeah. Like they yeah. have sores in their mouth. And I'm like, what have you been doing? The TikTok trend. And I'm like, oh no. Mm-hmm. So anyway. Yes. Everything in moderation is key, I think, in life. And then also, you don't need to be swishing with peroxide to whiten your teeth. It's so much easier to just put a white strip on. Yeah. Put. So <laughs> love that you said that. Love that because that was my big thing on this, this uh, especially because nitric oxide, if you're listening and you are a man or woman over the age of 40, you have 50% production of nitric oxide that you had in your 20s. If you're over the age of 60, you have 15% production. And guess what? Wow. If you want good sexual health, if that doesn't get your attention, you must have nitric oxide for normal sexual response in men and women. Even despite the Viagra and the medicines out there, they will not work if you don't produce nitric oxide. And I say that maybe as this little sensational because everybody cares about that part of our health. And it literally <laughs> matters your mouthwash. If, you, if you're destroying that microbiome, you cannot produce nitric oxide. So this is a really big deal outside of your mouth. And yes. I love that you're saying that. Now, one caveat, interesting, like you said, after surgery or whatever else, years ago, Ago, I did some dental DNA testing and I had porphyria mm-hmm. gingivalis, which you well know is a big player for mm-hmm. gingivitis, right? Mm-hmm. So at that time I did a very specific protocol with a heavy duty mouthwash to destroy that. I no longer have that elevated level, but that was an example of a protocol where you actually maybe test with your dental hygienist or your doctor, you see a pathogen just like I would check in the gut for pathogens and I'm going to specifically treat, and I might even prescribe the prescription mouthwash for 14 days or for 30 days for that kind of thing. But like you're saying, if you, um, microbiome, whether it's gut or mouth is always competing and trying to stay in balance and you want diversity. So if you just willy nilly go throwing antimicrobials like heavy duty mouthwash or hydrogen peroxide, you're going to kill off. Like you said, the good guys that protect you like lactobacillus streptococcus And then all of a sudden the overgrowth of candida or other types of bacteria like porphyria can grow. So I actually love that we're talking about this because it's so relevant. And even me up until weeks ago, I had a kind of over-the-counter healthy mouthwash, but I don't use that anymore. And I don't think I ever will. So (laughs) that's it. Yeah. That's my thing with mouth. Yeah. I love everything you said. That is so interesting. I didn't know the statistics about over age, all the, the ages and everything. That is really, really interesting. I feel that so many people, yeah, just, it's just, it's not something you need to do. If you want to use mouthwash, there are times and places, like you said, but it's not something you need to do. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, what a great conversation. What would be like the one takeaway, maybe the thing you hear the most, it's a myth or the one bit of advice that you would want to leave uh, listeners with. I think I would have to say white teeth do not equal healthy teeth. Just because your teeth are white doesn't mean they're healthy and vice versa. Just because your teeth are stained or yellowish in tint doesn't mean they're unhealthy. I just think we've come to such a point in society where everything has to look good. And then like we know with social media, I could go so many different ways with this, but just because something looks good doesn't mean it's good. Just because something looks bad doesn't mean it's actually fine. So that's my biggest thing. Don't think that dental health is all about looks. It's all about what's really going on in there. Love it. And what a great way to end. Um, Brings up one more question I didn't anticipate asking, but I want to ask because people are into whitening. Um, What are the harms or risk if you over whiten or over peroxide? Is it, does it actually thin the enamel or what kinds of risk might people want to be aware of? Or not? Yeah, it's yeah. No, it's there's definitely risks for over whitening. I would say over whitening. Most the rule of thumb is to not whiten more than four times a year. So you're not supposed to, you know, the whether you're doing like a week long whitening or if you're doing whitening at your dental office, a one day thing. Getting the 
achieving the results you need is considered one time, even if it's multiple days. So you're not supposed to do that more than four times a year. If you're doing it more than that, it's hard to say if it thins your enamel because everyone has different thicknesses of enamel as it is. So the way it's penetrating into your tubules and things like that, it's more, it's a, it could, the biggest, I would say, negative effect to overwhitening is sensitivity. So whether the, there's so many different reasons that can get you there, but regardless of the reason, you more likely than not will have sensitive teeth. A lot of people don't realize that with whitening comes sensitive teeth. If you're over whitening, you could really overdo that sensitivity. If you're whitening responsibly using especially ADA approved products that have been tested for safety and efficacy and you're using them as instructed, you should be okay as well. That's another thing. I always tell my patients, don't, if it says to leave the strips on for 30 minutes, don't say, I'm going to do an hour. I want it to work better. No, you're just going to so, so sensitive. Your teeth are going to be so sensitive. It's going to be un, unpleasant to live life. So just always follow the directions and you will be fine. My other thing about that though, however, I will, sorry, I have to say one right. thing about that <laughs> because I got to say it, something that's been on trend and it's, oh, it's, it's not good is charcoal whitening. So I'm all about the strips, the gels, the trays. As long as there's peroxide in them, you're good. It's even better, even better news if it's ADA approved. But for charcoal whitening, no good. The thing about charcoal is like, yes, it, it works. But over time, it is damaging your abrasive. enamel. Char mm -hmm. Yeah, so abrasive, right? The charcoal, there's different layers to your tooth. Enamel being the outermost layer. And then the next layer in is dentin. Enamel tends to be white. Dentin tends to be yellow. So although you're abrasing abrasive the abrasiveness is scrubbing it away yeah scrubbing away all these layers of the white enamel they might look really nice wow 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 nice clean clean but then when you get to that dentin layer you literally brushed your teeth yellow now you have a layer of yellow and the white is never coming back you probably need to get crowns or veneers i've seen this and, it, and only a few times i've seen it this extremely but it's an extreme sad thing. They're like, no, I'll just wait till the enamel grows back. I'm like, enamel does not grow back. So don't, yeah. So you don't want to be scrubbing your teeth yellow. I would be very cautious anything that has the word charcoal on it. Having said that, some toothpaste will say they are charcoal and they're not. They're just stained black because companies know that it's trendy. So they're just selling it, like calling it charcoal when it's just stained black. That's fine. <laughs> but um, so, but if it actually has abrasivity of charcoal, then stay away. Oh, I'm glad you said that because like in my realm, we use charcoal orally, not, not um, on the teeth, uh, okay. um, ingestible because it's an inert okay. substance that binds toxins. But um, so if maybe patients listening who've heard, you know, that it could be a good binder. I would agree with you. I want to be really clear. Do not use charcoal on your teeth, please. <laughs> so I just love that you said that because again, because I talk about binders in other scenarios, not on the teeth, um, they might, you know, so lots of good clear points. And I love, yes. love, love the perspective you bring the, the wisdom um, thank you again today for taking your time and for coming on the show. Thank you. I love your perspective. It was so nice talking with you. Thank you for having me. And thanks for all the good work you do in the world, the social media, bringing out, where can people find you speaking of? Of course. Yeah. So they can find me on teethtalkgirl.com and that's my website as well as my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash teeth talk. And one more thing I might as well mention, I've talked, I feel like so much about habit forming, which is so important. Yes. The home care that you do. I have so many patients that tell me that they're really good at keeping up with their habits after seeing the dentist for like two or three weeks. Exactly. And then they fall off. They stop flossing. They stop water flossing. Right. I get it. That happens to us. So I actually have an oral health coaching program coming this fall. It's called better mouth. So stay tuned. I'm so okay. excited. It, it, you, hopefully it will help more and more people to get a better routine leading to better dental health and better overall health. Like we all know it all relates soon that we will make sure that's uh, linked here if you're listening and uh, thanks again Whitney for your time thank you so much for having me you're welcome